measures. Next month on 12th August, we will discuss the maritime emission inventories and progress within NDCs. And for today, as you all know, we will discuss the blue economy and maritime climate action. At this moment, I request that we all make sure that our microphones are muted when we are not speaking, and especially when presentations are in progress. Uh, for any questions and comments, please use the chat and we will take it up during the panel discussion. In case our internet, uh, I mean, anybody or, or you uh, experience uh, unstable internet connection and it is lost momentarily, Zoom will automatically attempt to reconnect and restart itself and you will rejoin the webinar once connection is restored. And if you're experiencing any trouble rejoining or need any assistance during the webinar, uh, feel free to drop an urgent email or text to any one of us. Uh, please also note that webinar session will be recorded and uh, will be available on our webpage for later reference. We'll also be taking a picture uh, after the presentations and uh, most likely before panel discussion and uh, we'll request your cameras to be switched on then, right? Uh, coming back to the day, the uh, on the topic of blue economy, we all know that ocean surrounds and sustains us, providing things beyond our immediate visibility. Uh, the blue economy itself, when compared to a national economy, it would be uh, the seventh largest in the world. It operates in the planet's vastest ecosystem. Uh, oceans hold 90% of all of our water and approximately 80% of life forms. It encompasses all industries and sectors related to oceans, seas, and coasts. And, uh, you know, uh, beyond our immediate visibility, including coastal tourism, right? And with the emphasis on blue economy, uh, it has brought up transformational changes in maritime economic process. And it has highlighted further need for uh, environmentally uh, sustainable practices while we continue to benefit from our oceans. So the blue economy contributes to climate change mitigation by developing offshore renewable energy, decarbonizing maritime transport and greening ports. Uh, we will hear a lot and I, I hope that uh, we will benefit from this small uh, webinar uh, from MTCC Caribbean here. And uh, let's see, so blue growth and economy reveals the significance of maritime transport, uh, both in socioeconomic and environmental terms. And at this moment, I would like to introduce uh, our new colleague on MTCC team, Dr. Donnie Budlal. He's an associate professor in process engineering and holds a BSc in mechanical engineering, a postgraduate diploma in petroleum engineering and MSc in industrial innovation, entrepreneurship and management, and a PhD in process engineering. And with his research efforts, primarily focused on sustainability, environmental management, a cleaner production, GHG inventories and GHG mitigation. Uh, we are privileged and very happy to have him on board MTCC Caribbean. His work on the cost-effective strategies for greenhouse gas mitigation is highly rated and is regarded as being at the forefront of the field of uh, sustainable emissions reductions. His work is well recognized locally and internationally. Uh, with many related publication, he was also a UNDP appointed national expert on the GHG inventory for Trinidad and Tobago, an expert reviewer for national communications for the UNFCCC, and a GHG inventory and mitigation consultant. Uh, without further ado, I hand over to Donnie to take all of us through the today's session. Over to you, Donnie. Thank you very much, Captain Singh, for that introduction. It is certainly my pleasure to moderate this interesting session. Participants do allow me to join with Captain Singh to also welcome you to this webinar. And I start by saying good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where you're joining us from. I am somewhat fortunate to be involved in the many efforts, firstly with Trinidad and Tobago, and to an extent other countries in the region with respect to climate change action. Um, as some of you may know, with respect to Trinidad and Tobago, we are in the process of finalizing our third national communication and our first biennial update report. These are periodic reports that are necessary as a result of our ratification of the Paris Agreement. 
and the same applies to our regional partners in the Caribbean. And these reports contain, amongst other things, an estimation of greenhouse gas emissions and an assessment of the related greenhouse gas mitigation options as we move, move towards our reduction targets, um, NDC and otherwise. I speak about these reports, but it's important to note that this is not just text on a paper alone. These involve many projects, actual projects that are being analyzed and implemented, which are driven by policy actions. So related to this initiative, many terms are being used and rightfully so. So you know about the green economy, you'd hear about net zero, uh, blue and green hydrogen, for example. Today we hear about another relevant term, uh, the blue economy. All of these are important as you move towards sustainability and embracing the United Nations SDGs. So today's talk on the blue economy and climate action, which I think is just a, not a critical piece of what I call the sustainability solution puzzle for the region, would be delivered by two persons that is well known in the maritime sector, and I'm sure known by many of you, uh, Ms. Vivian Rambarat, Paris Ram, and Mr. Michael Raza. Vivian is an attorney at law with over 24 years experience in various aspects of maritime, marine, commercial, and environmental law. She joined the full-time faculty of UTT in 2008 and is currently an assistant professor of maritime law, as well as our director and head of MTCC Caribbean. She serves in several governmental, regional and international committees aimed at progressive development of the maritime sector and climate action. Michael, who's gonna share the floor with Vivian today, is currently an MTCC officer attached to MTCC Caribbean, where he has contributed significantly to the success of this project. Michael has recently completed his MSc in Operational Maritime Management at UTT, where the focus of his thesis was an assessment of Trinidad and Tobago's blue economy concept as it relates to the exploitation of non-living marine resources. So I expect that we'd be hearing uh, some of the findings from Michael's MSE in today's talk. So without further ado, I hand you over to Vivian and Michael. Thank you, Donnie, and good morning to all. Good morning. So as Donnie mentioned, today we are gonna look at the blue economy and maritime climate action. And the presentation is gonna essentially be between myself and Michael Rizak. And uh, Right, sorry, skip our outline slide, okay. So in terms of our outline of today's presentation, what we expect to cover, we're gonna do an overview of the blue economy just to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we are discussing and what we're talking about. We're gonna look at our focus areas in this um, presentation, being maritime transport and the management of non-living marine resources. Because typically we see a lot of the projects focusing on the blue economy, especially within the Caribbean, not necessarily focusing on maritime transport, the contributions that it can make and the particular challenges in you know, blue growth in terms of the maritime sector. So um, we'll also look, we will revisit the overarching legislative framework for maritime governance. We will look at the application of the tenets of the blue economy to management of non-living marine resources. And we will also look at a case study in Trinidad of a particular energy major, we're not gonna be calling any names, but we have data that we have discovered through a student project that was done as part of our MSc, but it uncovered um, 
very insightful work where we saw through the operational measures that were implemented there that that energy major actually experienced and is experiencing a 30% reduction in CO2 emissions through the adoption of operational measures. And of course, we must close with looking at some of our imperatives for enhanced maritime climate action. So it's not changing as smoothly as we thought. Right, oh, sorry. Right. So distinguishing between the ocean economy and the blue economy. Again, just to make sure our definitions are correct, our ocean economy deals with the sum of all activities associated with an economic benefit in terms of um, harnessing the resources, the living and non-living resources of our oceans and our marine environment. The blue economy, the fundamental difference, it looks at sustainability. It looks at the sustainable use of the ocean um, resources for improved livelihoods and with a view to preserving and conserving our marine health and coastal ecosystems. Using the, um, the definition and the categories of the blue economy that was stated by the Caribbean Development Bank in 2018, we have identified our established industries and some of you may be familiar with these. Our established industries include um, fisheries, shipping ports, shipbuilding, offshore oil and gas, marine construction, marine and coastal tourism, um, transport, maritime transport, R&D and dredging. Some of the emerging industries, and this is also true for the Caribbean region in particular, is marine aquaculture, biotechnology, surveillance and renewable energy. So some of you who are familiar with the literature on the blue economy would recognize these categories as they have been um, at the forefront of, of um, presentations and dialogues and reports of the World Bank and the CDB. But today, what I also want to look at as just as a reference point, because very often when you're looking at the literature on the blue economy, maritime transport is often um, absent, yet it is very present when they're trying to quantify the value of the blue economy. So in um, the European Union's blue economy report that was published in May 21, um, we see where they have actually identified their subsectors and their subsectors of the blue economy. Again, this is something that we can mirror as we try to quantify these things and try to gather data related to these activities. In the Caribbean, we know our particular challenges with respect to data gathering, but we need to start somewhere. Our baselines in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the adoption of technology was really a very small speck of where we need to be in terms of data gathering and marine intelligence and maritime intelligence data gathering. In Toronto Tobago, you know, I was really happy to see that the Ministry of Trade is now producing a business intelligence report specifically on maritime transport. You know, that's a start. And this is a sort of monitoring and distribution and dissemination of information that is required to be able to actually quantify the subsectors and their contributions to the economy and the blue economy. So today we are looking in this presentation at um, a case study on the management of marine non-living resources. And in that regard, we're gonna go even deeper in terms of a case study of one energy major that is involved in, of course, harnessing um, non-living marine resources. So as I mentioned, these are our focus areas. If we were to look at this graphic, which was adopted from the IDB, again, uh, our focus uh, is to try to bring the maritime transport into a deeper dialogue uh, in terms of the blue economy conversations, in terms of the, the climate financing for the blue economy and blue economy financing. We are not seeing maritime and marine transport playing a significant role or being at the forefront of projects.
as we as the MTCC, as we try to progress this agenda of the blue economy, as well as maritime climate action, we are currently undertaking a GAG emissions inventory of a select port in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we have not yet signed our MOU and we may have confidentiality clauses. So I'm not, I'm not gonna identify the port, but you know, I can say it's one of the most industrialized ports in the Caribbean region to give you an idea as to who exactly we're talking about. Just to revisit our legal framework to ensure that again, we are talking about maritime governance and blue economy from the same platform. And again, those of you that would have joined us for a peer-to-peer -peer workshop in February, this may be a familiar slide. And just to underscore that we do have, we often lament that we do not have the appropriate governance framework or we don't have a regional cooperation framework. But just to identify that we do have things that we can leverage upon. And of course we have the UNCLOS, which is the international framework um, for maritime governance. And we have the Cartagena Convention that calls for joint and individual action and it provides a broad regional framework for cooperation. And, um, you know, just to hear out, I see Dr. Lona Innes joining us. I'm very happy and hopefully she'll be able to also contribute to him from the floor as to how um, they are making progress because I know she's a key implementer with respect to this particular convention. So in terms of our existing and regional framework, just to highlight how the MTCC is part of the, the, the governance framework, we recognize that we have the UNAP, the Caribbean Environmental Program, the RAC RIMPITEC, we have the FEO, the CRFM, uh, and the IMO, and it's, it's various um, uh, regional activity centers and the MTCCs. But in terms of you know, bringing together the ocean governance for progress on the blue economy, we need to harness these initiatives. We need to have more roundtable discussions with respect to these partners so that we can actually make some progress in terms of maritime transport. At the Senior Maritime Administrators Workshop that was recently concluded this week, I'm happy to say that, you know, that there is going to be a proposal to CARICOM to, through the COTED group, the, um, the Trade and, um, and Economic Development Unit of CARICOM, that they are, that committee is going to take forward a paper where uh, maritime transport is going to, they're going to attempt to create greater awareness for the need for paying attention to the regulatory framework with respect to maritime transport, because this remains one of the areas of serious, um, I don't want to say lethargy, but it is, it, our legislative framework are inert. With respect to, there are one or two countries that have progressed in, in, in some areas and even less with respect to dealing with climate action. And those countries are less than five really. And you know, this is why um, the senior maritime administrators have continuously raised to the IMO. The problem really is in terms of getting the appropriate legislative legislation in, in place. And the IMO as well as the SME is trying to move towards addressing that. And one of the projects that the IMO is, is working with, with um, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, is this CARB Smart project that we hope to see implemented very soon that will focus on legal policy and regulatory and institutional reform across the Caribbean. And uh, that preparatory work will be part of a long-term project that will in fact lay the foundation for you know, the institutional reform we hope that is required. So we're gonna be looking for practical measures for realistic implementation and um, probably harnessing legal drafters and having them trained because continuously we find out of the SMA, we find uh, the continuous recommendation coming forward that we need a pool of legal drafters within the Caribbean dedicated to drafting maritime legislation in the culture and practice of the Commonwealth Caribbean. So having regard to our current state of inertia with respect to uh, maritime legislative frameworks, what we've also looked at in terms of um, progressing the agenda in terms of blue growth, again, revisiting as to what we do have. We do have some areas that have been really progressive 
and the Eastern Caribbean countries are one of those. They have been at the forefront of blue economy initiatives, and they have been the ones that have led the region in the implementation of blue growth strategies. And, um, you know, we know that some of them have even went ahead and established, um, uh, you know, dedicated institutions and ministries of, for blue growth. You know, and this, this slide actually what we captured and if there's anybody else who have identified and this, this was actually done earlier this year. So if you've updated yourself and you have a designated institution, please let us know in the chat. But based on research that was concluded earlier this year, um, these are the countries with dedicated ministries um, to buzz blue growth institutions. And why, there, why is it that blue growth institutions are so important? Is because one of the methodologies and identified institutional um, requirements for harnessing and implementing blue growth has been identified by the CDB and the World Bank. And that is having a dedicated institution or ministry in some cases um, towards gathering and harnessing blue growth strategies that would act as the liaison and the, the clearing house for these strategies. And I know it's easier said than, said than done. And it, there are lots of jurisdictional overlaps with this and other like initiatives. But, you know, we also have to bear in mind that, you know, sometimes the packaging is required for us to access the financing. So climate financing and project financing is one of the methodologies that we can access the resources required to progress our blue growth agenda. And if it is that they're identifying that you should have a dedicated institution, then let's have a dedicated institution. So with that, with my opening remarks, I'm gonna hand over to Michael to take you through um, the tenets of the blue economy as it applies to oil, the offshore oil and gas industry with emphasis, well, particular emphasis to Toronto and Tobago. Thank you, Vivian, and welcome again, everyone, for joining us. Um, as I begin, I would just like to know that as we are approaching a decisive moment for regional and international efforts to tackle the current climate crisis, with countries and companies building on the foundations of the Paris Agreement and pledging to reach net zero emissions, applying the principles of the blue economy concept within the offshore oil and gas industry provides a technically feasible, cost-effective, and socially acceptable pathway towards sustainable development, as the fundamental belief of the blue economy concept is based on the sustainable use of marine resources in a manner that it maximizes economic value while protecting the environment and preserving the environment. So as we see here, the extraction of non-living marine resources within the blue economy constitute established industries such as the offshore oil and gas sector. It typically falling under the ocean economy concept, some country excluded oil and gas from their blue economy roadmap, given concerns over its negative impact to the marine environment, as well as contribution to global GHG emission. However, if successfully implemented, oil and gas exploration and, ex and production can fall under the blue growth agenda by upgrading of the activities to ensure minimum environmental impacts and use of the highest level of sustainable measures and practices. To add to this, it is believed that the oil and gas sector is the most important sector within the contemporary blue economy in terms of technological and geopolitical status, which is coupled by its monetary contribution. So by adopting the principle of the blue economy outlined here, within the oil and gas operation and governance, we see the application of the three pillars of sustainable development embedded within the construct for blue growth. Therefore, a strategic path towards realizing offshore oil and gas blue growth potential is built upon long-term social and economic benefits with val which values and protect the marine environment by including circular material flow, renewable energy, renewable technology, ecosystem-based management within an all-inclusive governance framework. However, uh, as we know, there are various factors to consider when applying these tenants of the blue economy to the sector. Given its economic importance to oil and gas producing states, the future of the 
energy outlook must be given attention. Regulatory gaps are preventing the enabling environment for sustainable exploitation and energy efficient technology needs to be addressed. There are also significant resource constraints within the Caribbean that is evident in terms of monitoring and enforcement. And time and time again, we stress on the importance of data in guiding the planning and decision-making process, as well as creating avenues to, for accessing funding. For ocean governance, we see that the sectoral approach toward management and planning and use of marine resources has resulted in somewhat of a lack of coordination and cooperation among various arms of states and stakeholders. So we need to focus on filling the void between the end user for users of these resources and the extraction process. And well, lastly, and most importantly, the impacts associated with climate change. We have sea level rise, the stronger hurricanes, um, the impact to marine ecosystem, which can eventually lead and which is leading to more conflicting interests within marine space, the marine space. So if we zone into Trinidad and Tobago's oil and gas sector and look at a couple of the external factors affecting the industry, we see that the future of the oil and gas demand is bleak, particularly due to important states moving towards renewable sources and efforts to decarbonize the global economy, which has re resulted in decreased fossil fuel energy demand. It's also weakened links within the existing energy value chain, as well as the entry of new economies such as Guyana into the export market. And as we see here, some data compiled from the um, Observatory of Economic Complexity suggested that uh, exports from Chicago to Guyana saw an overall increase from the total exports. However, the export of refined petroleum from Trinidad decreased from an average of 42% between the period of 2015 to 18 to 13% of total exports in 2019. So it is therefore imperative that the future blue economy roadmap recognize the importance of the industry in facilitating economic growth and supporting local livelihoods while alternatives are being researched, accepted and implemented. Um, the government of Chicago have indicated that it, its intention to become a solution provider for providing clean energy to its LNG facilities while country, countries um, transition away from heavy fuel oil and prospects for hydrogen from renewable or low carbon sources was also considered by the ministry, which established a multidisciplinary committee to explore econ the economic framework for hydrogen development. And there are also other resources within the offshore oil and gas sector, which is transferable to blue, the blue grid. And the North Sea example, there are numerous lessons learned that we can adopt from acquiring adequate data, implementing policy intervention, incentivizing blue growth initiatives, providing funding, sustainable decommissioning of the rigs, as well as adopting offshore renewable energy. So countries can com contribute to the companies as well, sorry, can contribute to the realization of blue growth by incorporating these tenants within their corporate framework. Amongst others, they can align their company policies. There's um, monetary and voluntary commitments for reporting their due diligence when it comes to life cycle assessment, risk assessments, and very importantly, their stakeholder engagement with the local communities and government and their commitment to research and development. So we here, see here some examples of some companies in terms of um, setting their net zero emission targets. We have um, Equinor, which formerly operated strictly within the remits of oil and glass exploration in Norway. They have expanded their business model to include offshore renewable energy, among other sustainable initiatives. If we come closer to home, we have BP and Shell, two energy majors operating within the region, who have also set ambitions to come, become net zero companies by 2050. These companies, they aim to offer customers better low choices, choices of low and low carbon products and increase investment into non-oil and gas businesses. They are also working with stakeholders, including sectors that have proven difficult to decarbonize, such as aviation and shipping and road freight. And well, as Ms. Farsa mentioned, she will elaborate further on some interesting findings from my recent study on an energy major operating in Trinidad and Tobago.
So before we prov I provide some recommendation in terms of the oil and gas sector, it is key to know that addressing legislative reform and gaps within the reg regulatory framework is key towards maximizing return from the oil and gas sector and good governance is key to achieving effective blue growth management. Therefore, there must be a broad policy framework which creates the administrative mechanism that includes local knowledge and leadership this will be supported by the tools required for successful implementation and enforcement of the policy framework, and these should be updated frequently to address the dynamics of the industry. So in terms of harnessing blue growth in the offshore oil and gas sector, there's need for policy intervention, such as regional and national offshore energy policies that promote innovation and incorporate the tenants of the blue economy. This is required for a complete transformation on how we produce, how we transport, and how we consume energy. Secondly, operations should promote sustainable exploitation and adopt a precautionary approach. Approval regimes for oil and gas exploration should be adopted, should adopt a balanced approach, and address social, economic, and environmental issues. Um, also, a concerted effort is required on the data collection front and there must be an element of investing in clean technology. Greater effort is also required to facilitate measuring the value of the marine ecosystem. And finally, there should be increased collaboration and cooperation and increased audits and national accounting. Governing frameworks need to enhance sectoral integration, include multi-stakeholder and multi-sector coordination, and comprehensively capture long-term social economic development. Within the sector, we need to be able to um, address accountability, transparency, and effective governance while building education and awareness. So with that, I'll pass you back to Ms. Parsam to go in depth with our case study of the energy major. Thank you again, Michael. So, um... Again, in going into to demonstrate what can be done, even in the absence of the legislative framework um, by the energy majors. So as Michael indicated, two major energy players who are operating within the Caribbean have um, stated ambitions for net zero ambitions towards 2030. And in examining the, um, the operations, the, the marine and maritime operations of one of these energy majors, what we were able to recognize and we were able to document and capture for the first time was that this company through their operational measures, uh, were, they were able to secure a 30% reduction in CO2 emissions from their uh, spanning from their operations from 2013 to present. The methods that were adopted essentially, um, I categorized them into three broad, broad categories of vessel selection, reduction in fuel consumption, and better use of technology for communications and reporting. Um, I should say that this work is adapted from the dissertation of Sham Parasram, where he wrote charting a low carbon future for offshore marine logistics and he was supervised by Captain Singh and Mr. Stefan Nanan. Change, right. So in terms of the case study, just to highlight some of the key measures that were implemented, as I mentioned, vessel selection, choosing better vessels, choosing vessels that are um, more technology advanced, uh, things that are able, to, um, uh, to operate and, and companies that have embraced the energy efficiency paradigm. So they basically change their strategy in terms of having, uh, for having fit for purpose vessels from bas basically anchor handlers, which were the gas guzzlers of the operations to other more effective vessels, um, operating at economical speeds, no hotshot sailings, fixed sailing schedules, clearer guidelines on your marine operations manual, um, using closer um, ports for supply operations, and um, slower speed sailings, loading the vessels for optimal draft. And you know, there's a host of operational measures that were implemented. And I'm hoping that the author of this 
project is online. So that if you have any questions, you may ask him. But these were some of the operational measures that yielded substantial benefit. And the hard data is actually captured. Um, but the question is whether you all will be able to see it on this slide, but I'll walk you through it. In terms of the, um, the type of vessels and vessel selection, as I mentioned, um, and you know, these had a direct impact on the, the volume of fuel used. And of course, you know, Donnie and Stefan will be able to tell you is based on the fuel that they were able to identify and, and quantify the CO2 emissions. So in terms of the volume of fuel used by vessels, and this is spans from 2013 um, to 2020, the type of vessels you would see the anchor handlers. So these are the ones represented on blue. Those are high fuel consumption vessels. Then you have the PSVs that are medium. So you, you see the, the reduction on this type of vessel selection until it has a very, a, almost a sliver in 2020. So those types of vessel selection combined with the operational measures that were implemented resulted in over a 30% reduction, but we're saying a 30% um, reduction in CO2 emissions by this energy major. So coming back into the broader spectrum, having visited this and recognized that, okay, you know, one of the points that we want and the takeaways we want of, out of this presentation is that policy and regulation is an imperative. However, if we embrace the private sector and we, uh, we work closer with them, they have models that we can use and they are also um, partners that we can um, leverage towards bridging the gap for better maritime governance and for better blue growth strategies. So what we've identified within the Caribbean, and this remains the same from when we did our research on this earlier this year, there are insufficient blue economy institutions within domestic frameworks across the Caribbean. And as why we identified, it is an imperative for this, uh, these institutional constructs to exist because a lot of our financing institutions recognize them as the institutional mechanism for facilitating blue growth. So it's almost like a tick box to have if you want to be able to effectively bid or access climate financing. We continue to have inadequate cooperation amongst regional institutions and um, our inertia in maritime policy making, again, it continues, but we are hopeful with the progress we are seeing with respect to the domestic framework in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the, the resolutions of the SMA that is going to lobby CARICOM to make it a regional agenda for maritime transport and to, to create this, um, this transport agenda and bring it to the forefront. We are hopeful that we would see um, greater and faster turnaround in legislative frameworks with respect to the maritime sector. And we know that we all have the capacity to, to do it because after the pandemic, we are able to see that legislation is coming out overnight, you know, one day to another. So clearly, if we have that ability to pass legislation in parliament overnight, we can certainly, you know, dedicate some time towards blue growth and maritime transformation. We are also not very good at enabling our non-party stakeholders in ocean governance to be able to be our implementers. They operate in the fringes, but we need to bring them into part of our legislative framework because there is significant literature that showed the success of NGOs um, progressing marine and maritime agendas because they are not constrained by governmental bureaucracy. And we haven't had time to really underscore digitalization within this particular project and we have in this presentation, sorry, but we all recognize that digitalization is an imperative for enhanced efficiency. And we are recognizing how crucial it is in terms of reducing our carbon footprint. And we saw it when the pandemic, when we all started working remotely from home, the earth breathed a sigh of relief. You know, some places were seeing places they never saw in, in decades or in lifetimes because, you know, the emissions and, and the particulate matter 
was not in, in the air. So we were able to have cleaner air, cleaner skies. And, you know, this is good for the environment. And we want to see that adoption of digitalization becoming mainstream. And we saw um, governments within the Caribbean expediting their digitalization agenda as a result of the pandemic. But we are hoping that as we return into post, uh, you know, as we go into post pandemic, that the digitalization agenda doesn't suffer because it is an imperative in terms of managing our uh, and, and achieving our target goals on, on climate action. So to close, um, our imperatives that we, are, we have, would like to offer in terms of enhanced maritime climate action and recognizing that ports and the private sector can play a critical role with respect to one, quantifying the emissions from maritime transport and being able to identify tangible reductions in CO2 emissions in this sector. We are looking to ensure that ports recognize their role. And this is why, again, we are partnering with uh, an industrialized port within the Caribbean for the purposes of doing their emissions inventory. Uh, because they are, we, we see them as being a critical player in reducing the carbon footprint of the maritime sector. Shipping is already playing its part. And um, again, it's getting even more progressive with the IMO adopting even more aggressive measures with their recent adoption of the EEXI measures, the energy efficiency for measures, operational indicators for existing ships and the carbon and density indicators um, for existing ships. With those um, initiatives, we would see a, 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 um, a greater accountability coming in for shipping. And we need to, of course, leverage and facilitate technological advances and we know this may be capital intensive at first, but we are also, again, as I said, if we're embracing the private sector and the partnerships that can exist with the private sector, there are opportunities that we can document. And once we document, we can leverage them. We continue to need a paradigm shift for um, enabling blue growth. And that of course means that we need to have the institutions established with dedicated, roles in terms of establishing blue groups. I've emphasized and I've spoken to digitalization, but just in terms of a sub point with respect to that, all our systems should be interoperable. We need better communication against within our maritime stakeholders. And we are seeing that um, I, I saw in the Ministry of Terrain uh, Maritime Business Intelligence report that um, within customs and um, that integration between TT Business Link and customs on the single electronic window, that they were able to reduce processing times by 54%. So that, that is progress and that is identifiable progress that we can monitor. So hopefully that we are seeing that sort of data being monitored, that we will start to see progress taking place in terms of efficiency, because we know that efficiency in maritime results in a reduced carbon footprint. Again, with respect to the paradigm shift, our access to climate financing, um, you know, that paradigm shift is an imperative for us to be able to access it. We know that the Eastern Caribbean countries have been at the forefront of this. They have been benefiting from um, CDB and World Bank um, financing. And, you know, they are on the way to building resilient economies. And the larger Caribbean countries, um, Tran and Tobago, we can do with some catch up. And for those that are uh, now emerging with respect to oil and gas, such as Suriname and Guyana, you know, we would hope that you would look at the models and ensure that, you know, you're going the way of, um, you know, reducing your carbon footprint as far as possible at an early stage in the game, as opposed to being reactive. Another thing that we have not been able to touch significantly upon on this particular presentation is the importance of marine surveillance and maritime security. We know maritime security is, an, is important and one of the most significant areas in terms of management of our marine living resources. 
and our also our non-living marine resources. So this is an area that perhaps for future work and future webinars in terms of maritime security. So I know that CARICOM impacts does a fair amount of work and have had webinars on this as well. But again, we need to bring the partners together to ensure that we're all operating towards the maximum benefit of the region. Because right now I'm not sure we are quite there yet. And that's where we are at the moment. So thank you from MTCC Caribbean. And we are open to discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian and Michael. Um, I'll kick off a bit um, before, um, amongst all the great details in the presentation, um, I particularly like the informative case study. Um, but one of the major philosophical takeaway for me is uh, a, a statement made by Vivian. And Vivian, forgive me if I don't get the statement totally uh, in any exact words as you would have outlined it, but we are not seeing maritime or marine projects playing a significant part in sustainable management of our related resources in the region. If we marry that statement with what Captain Singh said in his introduction, we are surrounded by the ocean. It's about 71 percent of its surface and accounts for over 90 percent of all our water. Add to that the importance of maritime transport to the global economy. We're talking blue economy, but the maritime transport to that importance of maritime transport to our global economy and our regional integration and economy. Then my statement I made earlier can be amplified. And that statement was the blue economy is an important piece of a sustainable solution puzzle for the region. The blue economy is an important piece of the sustainable solution puzzle for the region. I wanted to just make that point coming out of a uh, very informative presentation, um, and amplify it so that it's a picture in our minds before we move on to the discussion. And having said picture in our minds, I think now may be a good time to take a, a group picture so I was told that my display picture is too serious. So I encourage this opportunity to smile and, and ask you all to smile at me as Captain Singh uh, and the other who's do our coordinated shots before we enter into the discussion. So if you can just share our video. Captain Singh, Michael, I think this is your speciality where you can coordinate and we take our shots and we have the ability to smile at each other here. Yeah? Yes, yes. Just giving them a, a little 10 seconds again to see who else sure. is on. Yeah, so... I'm sorry, I have no video. Okay. <laughs> Seems I'm more still... Yeah, so we smile. Let me just get one more. Great. Yeah, Donnie, you can take it back. Thanks, Michael. So yeah, so I'll, now that we had the time to smile together, let's discuss together. So um, I invite questions from the participants. Firstly, you know, perhaps you can just raise your hand uh, and I will call upon you. You can just place a question in the chat window. I'm not seeing any in the chat window thus far. Donnie, so I have I'll a question some time. that came directly to me. Sure. Um, it's a question to Darlin, from Darlin. Um, and it's a good question. And um, She's saying that there is already mention of maritime transport in the Treaty of Chagaramas for CARICOM. Can this be used as a starting point or does it require a new starting point? I don't think we require a new starting point. What we need is really to progress that and to leverage that. Um, because uh, within um, even the, well, we have the Treaty of Chagaramas 
within the Cartagena Convention, we do have um, mention of managing um, vessel source pollution. But what we don't have is that holistic broad framework. And especially now, because I mean, previous frameworks would have probably been dated because it would have been looking at, you know, the, the operationalizing of vessels and getting fleets on board with respect to enhancing trade within the region without even looking at the, um, the, the new paradigm in terms of blue growth. So our choice of vessels, even if when we're progressing that end agenda for maritime transport and intra-regional trade, we also have to take into consideration the type of vessels that we're bringing. Because, I mean, if we were to look at the energy major, the case study, they made a considered choice to use more energy efficient vessels. Are we as a region making that choice when we are purchasing our vessels? Based on what we have seen from recent purchases within the Caribbean, I am not sure we are doing that. We are not um, using the requirements of the new targets of Paris, of the IMO to inform our decision-making with respect to vessel acquisition. So our um, starting point, yes, it exists, but what we need is to progress that even further and ensure that we are building and acquiring vessels and pursuing maritime transport in the most sustainable manner and under the umbrella of blue, blue growth, which will essentially drive the type of decisions we make in the maritime transport domain. Thanks very much for that question. And thank you, Vivian, for that comprehensive reply. I certainly agree that um, as you move towards our targets, as you move towards targets and sustainable targets at that, we use what is already um, outlined and is already there in a meaningful manner and in an integrative manner. Um, and that's a wonderful question. Um, I'm not sure if we have any more questions from the participants. Darlene is thanking for the response. Thank you very much again, Darlene, for your questions. But um, I see one from Raul, and Raul is asking, uh, anchor handlers and offshore vessels exempt from IMO 2023. So I'm going to hand over that to Captain Singh. <laughs> Captain Singh. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, I mean, first of all, I, I must say that a very intriguing and uh, uh, the discussion on blue economy itself, I think the um, the platform here understands and it will it will connect to the question which is raised here i mean especially the osv vessels because there does not exist many uh how to say the the mandatory requirements within the uh framework or regulatory framework which can go on go on these ships but the question comes basic to the philosophical understanding of the change so uh connecting it to the previous uh question we don't need anything new. What we need is action. We have a starting point. We need to act now, right? So I'm not going to say that I, I quit my diesel vehicle or diesel car for an hybrid just because gov I will wait until government enforces it, or I'm doing it now because I feel that, okay, I can contribute to the reduction in emissions. So the initiative which you are seeing with oil majors is something which is driven from inside it is not i mean the two common uh, drivers are economic or regulatory right but the third factor which is social factor is catching up fast right so now if i want to project i am part of a supply chain where my consumers and my charters want to see a, a, a low footprint of the entire chain i will sir i will not wait for regulations because this is my business it will impact my business so, so it is not the regulatory factors which is driving this. Uh, it is more of economic and the social factors, in my opinion, which is driving. Because uh, if you will not invest them in today, very soon they might be, uh, how to say, stranded assets. Because regulatory, uh, they, might, they might comply with the regulations in force, but nobody in the market would like to hire them because it will, uh, you know, complicate the carbon uh, emissions along their wider logistic chain. And we, we should not forget that 
maritime transport is a derived demand, right? We, we can only respond to what our consumer would require. So tomorrow, if they don't want a ship, even if it is fully certified, complying with everything, but it will negatively impact their carbon emissions over the supply chain, they will not hire it. They will look for something greener. Thanks very much. Sorry, I think it also depends on the size of the vessels. Um, as opposed to the categorization of the vessels as to whether it, it is it is it is it is on the uh, size and the type of vessel but the but the idea is i mean uh if i understand that i mean we we may feel that okay we are complying with every every requirement but then the uh when we are discussing the topic especially to uh reduction of emissions and how we can contribute to reduction in emissions uh it has started going beyond the regulatory requirements. You may not be required, but then how you are seen today is, is social factor is catching up with the regulatory factor. Well, yes, it's the commercial considerations and again, the net zero ambitions of the energy majors that is driving the transformation of the type of vessels that support the offshore sector. So that's why vessel selection was an integral part of the strategy in terms of the reduction of the carbon footprint. Okay, thanks again. Thanks again for the question and for our panelists and Captain Singh as well for your response there. Um, I just have a couple of questions that I think um, could further engage in the discussion. And I know it was mentioned during the presentation about data and the challenges associated with data collection. But Vivian, perhaps yourself or if Sham is online, related to the case study that you presented on, um, if you can give us some ideas or some specific challenges that uh, you encountered with respect to data collection and how such challenges were overcome. And most importantly, how do you can improve uh, data related management systems in the region to engage further similar studies? Okay, so I'll take it in part. <laughs> the first part yes. of that question, you know, we, we don't have a culture of, um, of data collection and data sharing within the region. And that works to our detriment. So that's why, especially when we have our master's students, we try as much as we can to um, encourage them to write in their fields of expertise. And sometimes we get lucky and we get considerable insights into their operations. And this is exactly what happened with respect to um, Sham's work. Um, quite frankly, we would not have been able to access the type of data that he was able to draw from and bring to the table and analyze for, for the benefit of understanding the carbon emissions. And um, that was directly as a result of him leveraging his industry relationships so that we can have access to that data. So that's why in terms of when we have experts in the field participating, in academic studies, we always encourage them. So that's one of our methods of being able to gather and harness data. In terms of, if I, you remind me again with respect to your regional question. Yeah, uh, uh, what, what sort of uh, improvements, if any, you propose to improve data management systems as a whole um, in the region to encourage such similar studies? Right. So um, within MTCC, what we had in terms of what we tried, we produced in our first output, we, we created um, a dashboard and a data collection site for all the countries that were participating in the reporting. Um, and, and we initially, we had hoped that this would be continuously updated. And um, it, all, it all depends on what the country wants to update and how willing they are and capable they are in terms of updating. So earlier this year, we had to suspend data collection with respect to that particular aspect of the project because we had to focus on other areas. But once we have the commitment of the region that they want us to be able to continue to harness this data and become a clearinghouse for them in terms of not just the data collection, but analysis of that data for them. That sort of mechanism, we built that foundation through our first MTCC pilot project. 
Um, some of you may recall having seen it at our second regional workshop where we built that platform and basically countries would be able to log in and view their vessels and, um, and view um, the data that they would have shared with us. So as a start, basically a commitment to data sharing and participating is an important part of that data collection because what we have is already a mechanism there that can be built out to support the region in data collection and analysis. Thanks, yeah, data is certainly that knowledge that can drive change and implementation. Um, so I know during the presentation, yourself and Michael outlined some of the gaps towards uh, maritime governance for blue economy in the region. And you also listed a suite of, of actions imperative actions that can be pursued to fulfill those gaps. Michael or Vivian, if you were to advise governments in the region on adopting these actions, what specific and further guidance you'll give them? For instance, is there a recommended order of adoption that will make the response more efficient? So in light of all the suite of actions you listed, the imperative actions, if you were to talk to the government, the policymakers in the region, and give them advice on how to proceed. What would you say to them? Hello. Oh. One of the first things would be for me, legislative reform. But in the absence of that, and, and given the delays, with respect to bringing about that legal and institutional reform, I would say enable the private sector, enable the, the NGOs. So give the non-party stakeholders the opportunity to be key implementers. Make them part of your official delegations with respect to um, COP, with respect to um, international lobbyists, because they have the passion, they have the drive to make these things happen. So we have CARIMEPA and we have um, NAMEPA, which is a parent organization taking part. We have the Shipping Association, the Caribbean Shipping Association. These are um, institutions that can be, play a considerable role, but the governments need to enable them. They need to create the legislative framework to allow them to become the drivers. So it still comes back to legislative reform, but yeah. at the same time, recognizing that if you have to do one legislative reform, which one will have the major impact would be to enable the, the, the sector that can have the most impact. Right, okay. uh, Michael? Yeah, and if I, if I could piggyback on that, I mean, the operational and policy measures also have to be reinforced by the governmental agencies to ensure environmental stewardship by the energy majors. I, I would say strong private sector commitment to invest in future sustainable, sustainability initiatives is needed, and therefore the government needs the ease of doing business, as we know will constraints, I would say, in the ease of doing business can result in reluctance by the private sector to commit and um, invest in towards long-term sustainability. And they also, so governments have to consider harmonization and streamlining, streamlining of their approval processes. For example, uh, making their sector more systematically attractive to investment, um, especially if they intend to maximize the use of marine resources in a sustainable manner. I would also add to that, you know, policy mechanism have to focus on rebuilding impacted coastal communities um, things like investing in building local capacity, protecting natural assets, highlighting the role of women in coastal development, and promoting local entrepreneurs and um, enterprises. And to just a couple of that, you know, you need to quantify and detail a strategic cost benefit analysis of all marine resources, assign values, and determine return of investment, and use that to guide policy decisions. Certainly, so MTCC has an important role to play, um, not just to communicate with our stakeholders present, but to, to see that this reaches, you know, policymakers there um, so that they can be guided and the discussion continues at that level with the MTCC playing that important fulcrum, if I may, um, in those discussions. So a couple things, just a couple points I wanted to raise. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time. I know we're a bit over. I promise that we'll just be about three minutes maximum again. 
Um, I think Secretary raised his hand a couple of times. Oh, sorry. I'm very sorry. Captain Singh, forgive me. Please proceed. No, no, no props, uh, Donnie. Thank you. I just wanted to add to as as the two actions highlighted by Vivian and Michael. I think one thing which is which has also come, uh, I mean, which we have realized in the sector, and many many of us uh, agree on that. Now, looking at the bigger picture of uh, blue economy, as as we're discussing today, I mean, many studies, including the latest one from IEA. In May this year, uh, they have said to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, you know, the investments that will triple by 2030, right? And they are projected in in the scale of uh, four trillion dollars, right? Now, if we are looking from the economic perspective, this will create millions of jobs, many opportunities, and obviously a, a room for uh, how should I say? It, it can contribute significantly to the economic growth, including, you know, sales. So, but the question when it comes to how how do we, this knowledge can be brought to action and where, where when we are speaking about policy, the need for policy or why, why we are, why we fail to achieve this and two main things come out is the political will and the visibility of the sector itself. And I think the action, immediate action, which I think is where we, we understand ocean as a resource. We also need to understand that ocean not only surround us, as you said initially, it also sustains us, especially as island states, right? And so we need to invest in research or studies which can provide estimate or 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 it can estimate the importance of the maritime transport, both in uh, socioeconomic and environmental terms. So we, we, as MTCC or, or within the wider studies, we are seeing that how shipping is contributing emissions or what it is doing to mitigate the climate change, right? But very less is highlighted on how it is contributing on the positive side. I mean, there, there are studies, but we need to bring that to highlight. So we, we need to, we are assessing the legal frame, framework under, under which maritime transport uh, is developed or regulated or operates, but but we also need to highlight how vital or it is estimate, uh, important to estimate the uh, importance of maritime transport for the economy, society, and environment. Because that value will, will certainly increase the visibility and the political will. I mean, you can come up with a scheme which only needs, say, a $2, $2 million or $2 million euro project. But it is it, it can be land-based. And because it is creating employment, it is bringing economic growth and it gets the political will. Now something happening outside of the border on the ocean, which, which have this similar scope, but it does not catch the visibility because it is not presented in that way. So we need to connect that social and economic benefits of maritime transport so that it gets, the, gets its due of political visibility and willingness to pursue these matters, right? So that is that is what I would like to add. Thank you again. Thanks, Captain. Thanks. Totally in agreement. And um, that was actually one of the points I was going to make, um, not in so many details as you would have eloquently done, but um, um, related to that too, uh, the, you spoke a lot about how it can, a blue economy can, can contribute towards, and I know it's a sustainable measure, but I know it can, how it can contribute towards it's economic growth, and um, I really appreciate your, your contribution there. Um, the case study, for example, that Vivian presented on operational measures. Operational measures, um, Stefan will relate to this uh, quite easily. Operational measures directly, in many cases, correlate to a reduction in operational cost. And that itself is a benefit to the operators um, uh, from a positive economic point of view as little to, to no heavy investments are usually required for these things. So with respect to just a couple of things, uh, I wanted to say again, um, Michael spoke about the oil and gas sector and the blue economy right now in Trinidad and Tobago, a point just for consideration, not necessarily requiring a reply from the panelists, but uh, TNT is investigating CO2 storage in oil and gas reservoirs, um, some of which might be offshore. Um, the concept here is instead of CO2 being manifested as a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we trap it and we store it underground, hopefully securely and monitor over time. Um, so right now there's a proposed storage atlas study by UTT and UE 
um, being considered through the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So maybe this can be a consideration for integration into a blue economy. This, while Trinidad and Tobago is pursuing at this time, may have some relevance down the road from some, from some other uh, countries in our region, Guyana, Suriname, for instance. So I know we've been over time. Um, Kulan had mentioned that it's also good to see that the Scrap Iron Dealers Association will be invested in a ship breaking yard project in Trinidad. Um, and I see that both Michael and Stefan would have replied to some other questions that were um, outlined in the chat. So in the interest of time, with the nod from everyone, I think I'm gonna proceed to closing. Um, I know that, sorry, Vivian. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say in terms of, um, just before you close, and in reference to Captain's point with respect to visibility of the sector, this is one of the things that has been recognized continuously by the senior maritime administrators across the region. And we are hopeful that with CARICOM being lobbied to create a maritime transport um, policy and agenda, that we may see some measure of transformation um, taking place. Thanks very much. That might be a good note to actually move towards closing. So um, I'd just like to warmly thank the presenters. Um, I know this is a part of the mandate to build capacity in the region. And I would be the first to admit that though I was charged with some simple moderation duties here, I've certainly learned from the, the presentations today and the discussions. So I'd like to praise this effort. It's imperative towards uh, appropriate climate action. So when developing nations report their emissions, usually emissions from international transport, air and, and marine, is reported as a separate line item and often not targeted for sustainable GHG reductions as a result of being reported as a separate line item. So this place is a high dependency on the work done by the IMO, the GMN, and regional centers as, such as MPCC. And it's pleasing to see the wonderful progress um, in work being made and the capacity be, being built in the region. And actually the level of discussions that can really be um, have far reaching implications and uh, considerations for policy action and implementation. I hope that these discussions and this capacity building amplifies and I urge you to keep at it. Thanks again to all, have a good day. I just want before Donnie, one, one last thing, Donnie, before you close. Um, I saw Stefan had his hand up, but I believe it might have been to join us in um, a presentation that will be taking place, a webinar on the 12th of August, where Mr. Nanan and um, yourself will be playing a key role on discussing our maritime emissions inventories and progress within the NDCs. So, Stefan, did I jump you, or I, do you have anything to add? <laughs> that was that was one point, and it's just to also say that all of it is connected. We must connect it, right? All of these initiatives must connect in order to make sense and to drive us in a sustainable direction. 90% of the Caribbean space is blue, right? We only have 10% land, right? So the maritime resource is, it is our resource. Right, and how we develop the blue economy, how we incorporate renewable energies, transportation, food security, all of that gonna, gonna play a big part in how we sustain the region. So I just wanted to add that, and I hope everybody could join us for the, the, third, um, the third webinar in the series on the 12th of August, when we look at the NDCs. Thanks Vivian, thanks Donnie. Thank you, guys. <laughs> no, thank, thank you, guys. Take Sorry. care. Thank you, guys, thank and you take guys. care. Okay. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.
Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 